If you're an Umbraco enthusiast, you're probably wondering, should I be using Umbraco 13? And the good news for you is I'm going to answer that question in today's video. So give me 15 minutes and I'm going to tell you about every single new feature in Umbraco 13, as well as give you my opinion on each one. I'm going to tell you how you can install Umbraco 13 in under four minutes time. Yep, I did time myself. And finally, if you're an existing Umbraco user, I'm going to give you some advice if you should be upgrading to this version or not. Now, personally, these types of Umbraco new release videos are my favorite to record. I think this is a banger. So stick around to the end because this is a good one, I promise. Before you get started with Umbraco 13, the most important thing to understand is that Umbraco 13 is pinned to .NET 8 and consequently C Sharp 12. So there's two important things to understand around this. So first, you need to make sure that you have .NET 8 installed and you need to make sure that you have Visual Studio 2022 patched to version 17.80 minimum in order to get Umbraco to work. Now, the second thing is around installation and support. So .NET 8 is a LTS release. So LTS, long-term supported version by Microsoft. Now the other flavor of release is STS or standard term release. So let's have a look at this. So you can see from the Microsoft documentation, .NET 7, which was STS, was released in November 2022 and the end of life support is in 2024. So this is about a year and a half. Now, .NET 8, on the other hand, was released November 2023, and its support is two years later, so 2026 here. So what this means for you is that if you're building a greenfield project, basically just use the latest version of .NET and Umbraco, it doesn't really matter. However, if you have to manage a legacy site, instead of having to upgrade Umbraco every single six months, which might be way too much effort, instead, you should opt to just install the LTS versions of Umbraco. So because Umbraco 13 is LTS, this means that anyone from Umbraco 9 to Umbraco 12 should install this release. So now that we've established that V13 is the go-to version for everyone, let's see how we can install it. Now, if I'm honest, the installation instructions here, they don't really change that much between the different versions of Umbraco. So the first thing you need to do is install the v13.net template, and you can do that via the CLI by doing a .NET add package umbraco.cms dash dash version 13.0.0. With the template installed, you can now create a brand new Umbraco site either via the CLI by doing a .NET new Umbraco dash N and then giving your project a name. Alternatively, you can use the create a new project wizard within Visual Studio. If you filter by Umbraco, you'll find the Umbraco project, which is going to create an empty Umbraco CMS web application for you. Now you've got all your skeleton code. The final thing to do is to create the Umbraco database. So we do that by actually just running your application. This is going to download all your new Git packages. Then we're going to launch our site. Within the output here, you can see the server. So localhost 44305. Clicking on this is going to launch the installation wizard. And this is going to take a few seconds to go through. So basically give yourself a name and an email and a password. So this is basically your admin login. And this is the details you're going to use to access the CMS. So if I just say John, John at umbraco.com and then let's say umbraco umbraco now another important thing is that by default umbraco is going to use sqlite to store the database files now i recommend that you change this and use sql server because over the long run you're not going to be able to reuse your sqlite database in production now i'm not going to cover how to set up and configure sql server here if you want to know how to do that check out my Umbraco 9 video, which is linked to in the related tutorial in the description below. But the key thing is that click next, click install, and then what will happen after about five seconds is that we can log into Umbraco. And as you can see success, we've created and installed an Umbraco site in under five minutes. 
we're going to start off with what I consider to be the least interesting features and work our way to the best one. Now we're going to start off with a very simple one. The login screen has had a UI tweak and now it looks slightly different. The next feature is also login related and this feature is going to prevent concurrent logins. So yep, previously it was possible for you to maybe share an account Two people might be doing work on two different PCs and it will be possible for you to overwrite different content, blah, blah, blah. Now from 13 upwards, once you use the default template, if you look in app settings.json, you're going to see this security allow concurrent logins equals false. So if you're upgrading and you want to add in this feature, copy in this bit of JSON. Now from testing, things are a little bit interesting. So you see here that, you know, I've got a version open in Chrome. If I log in, using exactly the same credentials i can update my home page here do a save and publish and nothing has actually prevented me from doing this you can see that my change has been reflected i can now delete it now the reason why i'm saying this isn't because i don't think this feature works i think that as a developer just don't assume that because concurrent logins equals false is that you can't do something stupid locally the next thing to be enhanced is the multi-node tree picker. So you can see that I'm in the back end settings, I'm in a document type, and I've created this property, which is of type multi-tree node picker. So if I click on settings, if I go to edit here, let's clear this quickly. Now, previously, if you wanted to set the root node for your multi-node tree picker, you could use an X path or you could pick the node root. Now within the new world, you've got the ability to specify a dynamic root. So you can see here that I can now add a query step. And when I do this, a new dialog pops up and we have five options to choose from. So we have nearest ancestor or self, furthest ancestor or self, nearest descendant or self, furthest descendant or self, or custom. So we can still put in a custom step alias. Now these can also be chained together so we can add in multiple query steps. So this is gonna give a lot more power to this multi-node tree picker. Now, just in case you've never come across the multi-node tree picker before, or you've forgotten why you might need to use it, let's quickly have a refresher. So this property will allow you as a developer to define some sort of start data source. Then what happens is that when a content editor creates a page with a property installed, they're gonna see a tree and they can pick from items within that list. Now, this probably isn't the most used feature that you're gonna get, However, one important thing to note if we look at this article is that previously you could use XPath to create this dynamic homepage. However, from v14, the next version, this is going to be deleted. So now is a great time to refactor your properties just to make sure that you're not using XPath anymore. The next improvement is also a content editing update, and that is the ability to add blocks inside of the rich text property. So now let's quickly switch to the UI so we can see how this works. So I've got a page and on it I've added in the rich text component and I've already configured it. And you can see now that within the new world we've now got this little icon. And if I click on this you can see that all the blocks that I've allowed on this property will appear in this list. And if I click on it, you can see the block gets added inside my rich text. Now from here, you can see I've got this little copy button. I've also got the ability to delete a block quickly. So out of the box, the rich text editor won't allow you to do that. Instead, you'll have to configure the property when you add it to a document type. So let's see how we can do that. I'm going to start within the settings page. So before editors can drop blocks onto pages, you need to define some blocks first. Duh. Now, as I said, you do that within settings and within document types. So there's two ways of doing this. If you click on here, you can see we can create a document type. If we create a document type like I've got one here, then if you go to the permissions, you can see here is an element type. Make sure this is ticked or we can just do create an element type. And this is going to do exactly the same thing, except for this value is going to be automatically ticked for you. Now, if I go back to my page, you can see that I've got my rich text editor here. If I click on settings, you can see that if I go and edit down the bottom here, you've got the ability to have the display block option. If I can find it within this list, there we go, block. And then if I carry on scrolling down within this available blocks, 
you can just click on add you can see all the blocks that you've got added so everything which is an element type and then you can just add it here now while i definitely think this is a great addition to umbraco i personally probably won't be using it for my own content modeling now the reason for this isn't because it's a bad feature it's just that me personally i prefer using the block list property so using block list property you can create a bunch of blocks like a rich text block a banner block and then within the ui itself editors are going to have a better experience for how they want to lay out the page so this will do exactly the same as adding blocks into rich text editor so it's up to you which one you prefer as i said my preference is the block list property the next set of updates can be found within the content delivery api and there's basically two things that you need to be aware of here so first off the content apis have been updated to take additional filtering parameters so you have the ability now to do nested field limiting as well as nested field expansion so basically if you need to do a query that gets children you now have more options about the data returned from those children the other thing to note is there's also some breaking changes with the media api so we can see this within the swag documentation so if we go to umbraco swagger index.html from here filter it to umbraco delivery api you can see that in v12 we were using v1 and then from umbraco 13 onwards you can see that we have v2 endpoints and this is also the same for the media apis as well now for the new fields if we look at this content one and scroll down you can see that first we've now got this fields prop and if we look in expand you can see that we've got four different options here now if we compare this to the v1 api if we scroll down you can see that we have no fields here and then if we look in expand you can see we only have three options so the reason why this is a fantastic improvement is because if you're creating something like a news listing page and you need to display blog articles instead of having to create multiple different queries you can specify with more granular detail what needs to be pulled back in a single query so you can display the listing and certain information about the news articles all in one hit and this is the same if you're creating say like a product listing page with a product detail page being pulled in so in my opinion this is another great step forward in umbraco's ability to help people build headless websites now the next new feature if i'm honest is the most exciting thing in the world however it is really important now from a dotnet 6 we had minimal hosting bundling and basically what this meant is that when dotnet 5 first came out we had a program and a startup.cs however microsoft realized this was unneeded so these two things got merged together and now we just have a program.cs now i've quickly switched solutions within visual studio and we're now looking at my umbraco v12 headless start kit which you can also download from my github for free now the important thing to note here is that i'm only using a program.cs however in order to get this working i had to add in this kind of hacky bit of code where it says app services required i run time state blah 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 now i'm not taking credit for figuring out how this works i copied this somewhere online can't remember where but the important thing is that this didn't work out the box and it was a little bit hacky to get this up and running and finally jumping into the third solution of this section i've now loaded up the umbraco 13 default template website and you can see that this now uses program.cs only unlike v12 in here we don't have to add in any hacky code instead we've got this await app boot umbraco async method here that does everything for us this is really clean and all the umbraco documentation has been updated to ignore the fact that startup.cs ever existed now if you're thinking about upgrading but you can't be bothered to put your startup cs within your program.cs the good news is that umbraco is backward compatible so you don't need to refactor everything if you don't want to however my personal opinion would be to get rid of that startup.cs because it's not needed anymore none of the docs online is going to affect it and it's just a bit of legacy pain that microsoft shouldn't have added in the first place we finally got to the best feature of Umbraco 13 in my opinion and it's on the screen right now and it is webhooks 
Yep, so within V12, we've got the content delivery API. However, for me personally, one thing that was always missing was webhooks. Now, regardless if you're using static site generation or server-side rendering SSR within your headless website, webhooks are a key bit of getting the communication from your CMS and website to work. So if you're using static site generation, whenever you update or delete or modify a page in the CMS, you'll need to trigger your web host in order to rebuild the site in order to regenerate those pages. Now, if you're using server-side rendering, whenever you update, create, delete a page, what you want to do probably is ping your cache provider to invalidate the cache in order for your new data to be shown on your site. And this is where the webhook feature is really useful because previously you would have to code this yourself using a composer. However, now we can do everything within the UI using this new webhook screen. So in terms of the webhook creation, click on the big create webhook button to create your hook. Then the first thing you need to provide is a URL that you want the hook to ping. The next thing to do is add in the events. So you can associate a webhook to trigger on either content, delete, publish or unpublish, or media, delete or save. So let's click this. After doing that, you need to associate the content types that you want the webhook to trigger against. So let's say I want it to trigger for my pages. Then if you need to add in any HTTP headers, you can do that here. So let's say that you need to ping your webhook to refresh the cache. You're not going to want to have an unauthorized URL, so you're probably going to have to add in some sort of access token here. Now, aside from creating hooks, there's also a little log here so you can see when your hooks have been run, all the retry counts, all that kind of good stuff. Now, I've definitely been really impressed about how quickly Umbraco is moving towards headless adoption. Now, to get the perfect trifecta, I'd still like to see a front-end NPM package that wraps the content delivery API, but with all these steps, this is definitely a great move in the right direction. So, to summarize all of this up, even though Umbraco 13 doesn't really have any major game-changing capabilities, unlike the upcoming V14, it is an extremely solid release with some great new capabilities. Now, because it is an LTS, long-term supported version, regardless if you're Greenfield or you manage an existing site, you should be using this version of Umbraco, period, so use it today. Now, I should also mention that expect to see a mini series on Umbraco in the new year. Because it's Christmas, I will put things on hold. And typically, I tend to do videos based on feedback and comments. So if you want to see me deep dive into a topic, let me know below. Now, with that being said, I do release a video every single Sunday. So if you're interested in Umbraco or .NET stuff, don't forget to hit subscribe. And if you have enjoyed my silliness and this video, don't forget to click on like. And if you think I could improve this video, instead of just saying thumbs down, let me know in the comments. Now, the final bit is I do a weekly Sunday newsletter all about .NET. It's free, link to below. There's also a related tutorial, link to below. And the final thing to say is, you know, Umbraco uses .NET 8. So on the screen right now, I've recorded a video all about the best features in .NET 8 C Sharp 12. So check that out if you want to learn about what you can do. Aside from that, until next Sunday, happy coding.